Thank you, Johnny. And now is the time to turn to science with uh, Ichik's lecture on Quo Vadis Tumor Microenvironment? Question mark. Ichik. I'm a bit excited, but um, I'll try to uh, <clears throat> convey some scientific messages nonetheless. First of all, let me thank uh, Professor Kloft and Rabinovich for their warm words. They left, unfortunately. Then uh, my friend Johnny, thank you very much for the nice introduction. I recognized myself sometimes. Uh, one very important thing is to thank and express my appreciation to Gerda Herz. Gerda, where are you? Please raise your hand. Thank you very much for, for establishing uh, this prize and uh, for bringing great uh, and deep thinkers in science to Tel Aviv University uh, uh, for the benefit of faculty and students. I also, I'll, I'll do it in the end, but let me also do it in the beginning. I think it's uh, the time to also thank my team for dedication for great cooperation, for mutual, and I may say it, I usually don't, for my love to you. So thank you for being here. While Shell is putting on, I'd like also to acknowledge and thank the Dan David Prize for, uh, for uh, a good relationship, the highly interesting and challenging work, and for the support of this uh, symposium. Thank you very much. Um, as Johnny said, Kovadis, where are you going? Now, this is the church on Via Appia in Rome, uh, commemorating the meeting place of Peter, uh, fleeing from Rome because he was going to be crucified, and uh, of Jesus, who was going to Rome to be re-crucified. And Peter asked Jesus, Domine Kvobadis, Lord, where are you going? Um, it's really unusual, and I would say even unaccepted, that somebody asks his boss, where are you going? I mean, it's not polite. You, do, you don't do those things. But uh, St. Peter actually uh, meant something else. He wanted the guidance and the answer of Jesus to ask, where are we as a community? Where are we going? What should we do? And I think I am at, in the stage, at least with respect to my own research, to ask where am I going as somebody who works on tumor microenvironment? Where are, where are we going? Where should we, where should we uh, go? Now, as you know, I have a long-standing relationship with a tumor microenvironment. And this started 
during my postdoctoral period with David Pressman at Roser Park Memorial Institute between 65 and 68. While there, I went to a meeting in which Frank Dixon, a very well-known immunologist, uh, I would say autoimmunologist, um, reported that antibodies against glomerular antigens are actually the ones that are responsible for glomerular nephritis. And these antibodies, as Dixon reported, were localized on the glomeruli in patients. Uh, listening to that, this gave me an idea that maybe, maybe, the same thing may occur in cancer patients. It may be that because we in many cases, in most cases in fact, we don't discover antibodies against tumor antigens in the blood, maybe they are mopped up, they do localize in the tumor cells exactly as these antibodies against the glomeruli um, coat glomeruli. So I went back to the lab and looked at, um, at the primary uh, carcinogen-induced hepatomas that we were working on at that time and saw that they are coated with an immunoglobulin coat. Normal liver was not. So we eluted this antibody from the uh, cells and, um, and investigated some of their biological properties. Now, this has been uh, published in 67. A large fraction of you people were not born at that time. And uh, that's a that's, um, thing that being 80, I mean, you can talk about studies that you were, made, you were doing in 67. Uh, a gap of quite a few years between this paper and my interest that started uh, quite a few years ago is still continuing and this is metastasis. I must say that one of the people who generated in me the interest and the enthusiasm to work on metastasis is sitting here and this is my friend Josh Fiddler. Uh, he is one of the pioneers of metastasis research and under his influence, in fact, I uh, started to um, work on that as well. Now, I think the challenge of all of us, including those people, I should say the challenging of all of us should be to try to prevent hold, retard or cure metastases because these are the killers of a cancer patients. And again, um, uh, uh, Johnny did the work for me. Uh, he uh, mentioned uh, Stephen Paget. He didn't mention the whole uh, sentence that I'd like to give to you because the sentence has also some sense of poetry. When a plant goes to seed, its seeds are carried in all directions but they can only live and grow if they fall on congenial soil. In today's nomenclature, the seed is the tumor and the soil is the metastatic microenvironment. I'm sure that a scheme like that of the metastatic spread in various forms is known and familiar uh, to many of you. I'd like here to a point, uh, actually emphasize two points. Number one, if you look at the primary uh, tumor on top, do we have a pointer? Um, if we look at the primary tumor on top, uh, it lives in the microenvironment of, uh, uh, of the primary tumor. And then if you look at metastasis, thank you very much for that. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, if you look at the, met, at the metastases in a different organ, it has a different microenvironment. This is point number one that I'd, um, I'd go further in uh, later on. The second point is that at the metastatic site, 
there could be uh, what we call do uh, micrometastases, which are dormant. In other words, the rate of death of these cells and the rate of proliferation is the same. So the cells stay in a steady state. And this phase is called dormancy. So dormant cells can exist, as we have shown in quite a few studies, uh, do, uh, dormant micrometastases exist in metastatic sites, and at the same time, uh, you can find uh, clinically overt uh, metastases at the same site. Those two cells, two types of cells, can live together. Now, just to illustrate, especially for the people who uh, are here and are not um, versed in the uh, metastases, just to illustrate what I just said. Uh, in the case of melanoma, you have a primary melanoma, let's say here on the arm. Uh, it grows, it spreads to the lymph nodes, to other organs such as liver and lungs, and finally also uh, possibly to brain. It is obvious to everybody, even to non-biologists, that the microenvironment of these metastatic organs is different. I mean, we all know that liver is different from lungs, lungs is different from brain, and all of them are different from, um, uh, uh, from uh, lymph nodes. So there is a different metastatic microenvironment, and I think it's a big mistake um, to read in the literature that a, a, that a tumor is metastatic, or you read metastatic melanoma, you read metastatic breast cancer, whereas there should be specification uh, where these metastases exist. Many people, including ourselves, reach the conclusion that these are the interactions between um, uh, tumor cells and the metastatic microenvironment that controls, from at one hand, tumor dormancy, on the other hand, a tumor progression. Um, and when asking the question, the topic of this lecture, Kovadi's tumor microenvironment, where are we going? We are going to focus in the rest of this lecture on the interactions between tumor cells and the metastatic microenvironment, and I'll touch upon three topics. Number one, talking about the metastatic microenvironment itself, talking about the fact that tumor cells hijack physiological pathways to survive and propagate, and finally, I'm going to discuss the yin-yang activities in the tumor microenvironment. Yin-yang, for those who don't know, that the same component in the microenvironment could act as a pro or an anti uh, uh, malignancy factor. Let me start with the tumor microenvironment. One can ask several questions or raise uh, several points. Two of them are given here. Just to repeat what I said before, the different organ sites means different microenvironments and that the signals in these microenvironments differ from organ to organ. And the question I can ask here is, do tumor cells in one metastatic site differ from tumor cells in other sites? A related question is, can we recognize and identify site-specific metastatic signatures? A recent work um, from our lab um, done by Sivan Israeli, shows that endothelial cells from two different organs, one from brain, one from brain, one from lung, and, and here she analyzed the expression of a tight junction protein, of an adhesion protein, uh, called Claudin. Now it turns out that endothelial cells from the brain do express clothing, whereas endothelial cells from the lungs do not. Both are endothelial cells. Both make the same function. 
but at different microenvironments, they are different. Uh, another piece of work, that of Ina Zubro, uh, Zubrilov in the lab, uh, tested the, um, the metastatic phenotype of uh, melanoma cells. The blue, uh, uh, the blue things are untreated melanoma cells. As you can see, they make brain metastases, they make lung metastases. In fact, I should say these are brain and lung micrometastases, and they don't make micrometastases in the liver. However, if these cells uh, are being made to resist Vemurafenib, which is an anti-melanoma drug, very famous recently, um, uh, these cells change their metastatic phenotype, uh, brain metastases remain as it was, lung metastases is enhanced, and liver metastases appears all of a sudden, uh, whereas the untreated cells were um, not metastatic. Another uh, work also concerning Claudine, uh, another piece of work of uh, Sivan Israeli, and this is the uh, metastatic phenotype of melanoma cells that express very little or overexpress Claudine 1. On the top, you can see that the, that the cells that express very little Claudine make micrometastases both in the brain as well as in the lung. Once you overexpress Claudine in these uh, melanoma cells, you eliminate the brain metastatic capacity, but you leave intact the capacity of the cells to make lung metastases. Let me now move uh, to another point, which I think should be remembered. And we all know it, but I don't think we really uh, uh, pay a lot of attention to that. The fact that tumor cells uh, hijack physiological pathways to survive and propagate. Uh, two published examples is that uh, one um, was already published uh, some time ago, um, that neuroblastoma cells employ the CCR4, CCL12 axis to migrate to bone marrow. Um, and uh, these are uh, the publications on that. And that melanoma cells employ the CCR4, a different chemokine receptor, CCL17 and CCL22 axis to migrate to brain. And this is again the work of uh, Sivan Israeli. Another work that has been, that is being done at present in collaboration with Tom Carmichael, a neurobiologist at UCLA, is the question whether melanoma cells can utilize post-stroke repair mechanisms for establishment of brain metastases. The answer seems, we don't have a final answer yet, the answer seems to be yes. We know, and these are results that we obtained, that both melanoma cells, as well as stroke-like conditions, alter the expression and or the release of common pro-inflammatory factors, such as CD40 ligand, gamma interferon, and IL-23 in brain microenvironmental cells, such as astrocytes and brain endothelial cells. Um, Soluble factors secreted by stroke and control astrocytes and brain endothelial cells affect differentially the expression of genes in melanoma cells, including signature genes of brain metastasizing cells. This is the work of Sivan Israeli and Maya Rappaport. Uh, uh, both are here, uh, both belong to my group. The third question, and the one that I spend a little bit more time discussing is the yin-yang activities in the tumor microenvironment. Cancer research, as well as other fields, is very much influenced by fashion. 
And the fashion today is to say that the microenvironment helps the tumor cell. This is true in very, very many cases. But I think we should consider also the opposite because there are facts that in fact show that the microenvironment, and this is mainly immunity, the immunologists say, why didn't you uh, say that in the beginning? Immunological factors uh, do uh, act as anti malignancies, anti uh, metastatic factors. So here you have a, um, uh, I mean the fashion is also influenced by the amount of work and factors that has been reported. For instance, uh, the pro-cancer factors in the microenvironment are many more than the anti uh, the, the anti-malignancy factor in the microenvironment. As I said, the anti-malignancy factor mainly uh, immunity. Let me now turn to just citing a few papers um, that we have shown that the tumor microenvironment exerts pro-malignancy functions. Number one, tumor-bound antibodies enhance tumor growth. This was done by a, the first, my first graduate student, Maya Ran. She's unfortunately no longer with us um, in uh, different papers. And uh, with another former graduate student of mine, and now a colleague, that anti-tumor antibodies are degraded uh, by tumor-derived proteases, and this was in the early 70s, um, degraded by, um, by uh, proteases, uh, enzymes, and from an antibody that is capable of killing tumor cells, uh, there was a generation of blocking, blocking factors. Um, uh, and the person who did this work is sitting in the third row here. His name is Yona Kesari. This is Maya Ran. I just wanted to show you the picture. Again, this was my first graduate student. Unfortunately, she is no longer with us. This is a very, very recent work uh, done by Anat Klein uh, together with uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Netta Erez. And to put a long story short, here is the, uh, the reaction of astrocytes, and we're going to hear a lot about astrocytes today from uh, Josh Fiddler. Um, the activity of astrocytes that has been activated or stimulated by melanoma cells, um, the uh, effect is that these astrocytes, the stimulated astrocytes, secrete a, uh, secrete a cytokine, IL-23, and this uh, cytokine um, is, uh, is, pro, is pro malignant and enhances um, um, invasion by a, a mechanism that I don't have to go into now. I don't have time to go into now. Let me now turn to the last part of this lecture, and this is the work uh, showing that the tumor microenvironment could also exert anti-malignancy functions, and these functions are in fact non-immunological in nature. Uh, here we have, I'll have to spend a minute discussing dormant micrometastases. Uh, in many cases there is a lag period, sometimes years, between a successful treatment of a primary malignancy and disease recurrence. And that the recurrence is due to residual disease, which in fact are dormant micrometastases. The question that we addressed was what keeps micrometastases dormant? This was the question that we addressed in this particular study. And here we were very much stimulated by a paper 
published uh, by uh, George Klein in 2007 uh, with the title, Why do we not all die of cancer at an early age? The mechanism that George postulated, he called microenvironmental control or non-immunological surveillance. The hypothesis that we had was that microenvironmental control functions also in controlling progression of dormant micrometastases towards overt metastases. It may be that organ, maybe specific factors, restrain the proliferation of micrometastatic tumor cells. And uh, two of my students, Anat Klein and Shelly Maman, saw that brain or lung-derived soluble factors from normal mice restrain the proliferation of correspondingly xenografted human melanoma or neuroblastoma cells. Now let me now go deeper into the study of neuroblastoma. This is a, a study that Shelley Maman uh, published last year, and the essence here is that lung-derived factors inhibit viability, induce apoptosis and cell cycle arrest, and down-regulated ERK and focal adhesion kinase signaling of lung metastasizing neuroblastoma cells. The next thing that Shelley wanted to do is uh, to um, isolate and identify the inhibitory factor. To this end, Shelley traveled to the Institute of Human Biology in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, headed by uh, Professor Robert C. Gallo, uh, who is sitting here in the first row, um, and, in, and in collaboration with a professor in his unit, uh, Wian Lu, um, Shelley uh, isolated and identified the factor, and this turned out to be rather unexpectedly, the beta subunit of hemoglobin. This is now mouse hemoglobin. Very unexpected because the hemoglobin has very specific roles. A role of resistance, of tumor resistance, has not been reported. So uh, this is rather novel. Um, the next question, of course, was whether or not the human beta subunit of hemoglobin can do the same? The answer is yes. And here are some experiments showing that the human uh, subunit of uh, hemoglobin, the beta subunit, uh, can uh, cause G0 to G1 arrest, can inhibit cyclin D1 expression, and can downregulate the phosphorylation of ERK. Shelley then wanted to identify and did identify the active moiety in the beta subunit of hemoglobin, and she identified the protein. Here it's called um, protein 11. We then call it, we now call it metox, uh, a, a substance that is toxic for metastases, and uh, this has the uh, biological activity of killing uh, these cells. Now, in vivo, um, talking sometimes, many times, to my uh, good friend Yona Kesari, who once used to be um, a student, but then he forgot all the troubles I did for him. Now we're good friends. Um, uh, he suggested, he said, you are interested in eliminating lung metastases. Uh, I used to work with uh, peptides that I wanted to apply to mice, and the very nice things, especially if you want the substance to go into the, uh, into the lungs, uh, put them on the nose. They'll sniff it very quickly. Indeed, they do. We give, uh, Shelley gave those mice eight uh, doses of the isolated peptide, these were uh, uh, mice, uh, nude mice, that were harboring um, human neuroblastoma cells autotopically in the adrenal. And as you can see here, this peptide uh, decreased very much 
both the volume of the tumor as well as its weight. The control here was a scrambled peptide, so it's exactly uh, the same amino acids, but a different organ, a different order. And what is much more significant, or interesting at least to us, is the inhibition of uh, metastases both in the lungs as well as in the bone marrow. So, the same thing may also work in melanoma. Factors from the brain, uh, here we didn't isolate yet the factor, but factors from the brain, um, a brain supernated, um, can inhibit the viability of melanoma cells. Why are these factors interesting? First of all, as uh, Bob always said, this is a, this is a therapy. Could be a therapy. Um, it could, as it does also, an antimetastatic because it regulates tumor progression. It overcomes drug resistance. I won't show you the results that we have. And could serve as a biomarker for residual disease. I also don't show you the results, but uh, it could serve actually as a biomarker. So the take home message in this case is that the tumor microenvironment could either uh, stop or act as an anti-malignancy factor or it could enhance and support further progression of, uh, of tumor cells. And now, finally, I'd like to answer the questions or the question, quo vadis tumor microenvironment? And here, I'll give you two answers. One, if you don't know uh, where you are going, you might wind up someplace else. The second thing is, uh, as an answer to that question, I wish I had an answer to that question, because I'm tiring, tired of answering it. The uh, person who did these clever answers is Yogi Berra. This is the group, we have some additions, and I want again take this opportunity to thank them for a great, as you can see, uh, lots of ladies, one poor guy. Uh, these are the names and these are the people we collaborate with um, uh, outside and at Tel Aviv University and outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Itzik, for providing us all the answers to the question. However, if there are still one or two questions, we can take them at this time. Speak up. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Neither am I. be uh, point number one in our future plans uh, to look at other tumors but a uh, neuroblastoma. I mean, I obviously uh, think about breast cancer and the other cancers that are much more uh, prevalent. Okay. Thank you, Itzik. I think we can... Oh, I... Thank you.
I'm not sure I got your question right, but I can tell you that we have variants from the same human malignancy. Some variants make metastases, other variants do not. And this actually, this way of, analyze, of uh, analysis was first done by, uh, by uh, Professor Fiddler. Okay, I think we can, we are running late of time, so thank you again.